I hope everyone's had a great lunch. Um, I'm really happy to start off our second to last panel on this humanities conference. We have, uh, this is titled Writing as Action, and we have Sagarika Ghosh, Edward Mortimer, and Nanjala Nyabola, and we're moderated by uh, Mayanka Mukherjee. Happy to hand this over. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so welcome all to the panel, and thank you so much um, for, uh, for being here. Uh, I'm Mayanka, and uh, I, I do cultural anthropology, so a lot of my field notes got written down in the form of ethnographic stories. So for me, I come to writing very much as a practice for thinking through ideas, and that makes me very curious and excited about this panel and to just yeah, have a word from all of you about why you got into writing, how you see, act, how you see writing, different genres, different practices, and the different negotiations that you have to make um, to write in the context in which you write. Um, so can we start with you, Nanjala? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. OK, where I come from, it's very rude if someone says good afternoon and you don't say good afternoon back. <laughs> so <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, we have five minutes, so I'm just going to blitz right through this. Um, my name is Nanjala Nyabola. I am Kenyan, born and raised, in the Rhodes Clough class of 2009. And I wanted to begin by observing something. Um, this is actually exactly 10 years since I f first walked into this room. And every single portrait of a person of color on this wall and of a woman, except Nelson Mandela, has been put up after my time here. So I am very both conscious of the fact that there's a lot, and this is probably the most diverse Rhodes audience I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and the reason I said yes, the first time Lucas asked me, he knows that I, I took a long time to say yes. Um, I didn't have a great experience at Oxford, and I, I didn't want to come back. But the reason I came back is because I know what it means to be on the other side of the stage, and to look up here and receive the subliminal message that you are not, you don't belong here that your experiences, your images, your desires, your hopes, your dreams are, are not what the Rhodes Scholarship is about. And you know, in my two years at Oxford, the only uh, black woman that I saw speak here was Dembisa Moyo, and it was a disaster. <laughs> um, and so that's why I came back, and I hope that something that we say up here, that you hear up here, makes you think differently about um, your own hopes and your own choices and your own um, dreams you know, about what you want your career to look like, and especially in the humanities. Especially in the humanities, because I think we are in a moment whereby we're starting to question um, the lack of ethics and the lack of vision in a lot of the things that we've been building as, a, as the human race for the last 10 years. I do a lot of work in what uh, we are now calling the digital humanities. Uh, I look at social media, I look at elections technology, I look at all these things as an independent scholar, and I go to conferences where people are like, but the system was technically strong. How could it destroy a country? It passed all the checks and balances, and it was, we checked, our technicians checked it four times. How could it bring a country to its knees? How could it result in election violence? How could Facebook lead to a genocide in Myanmar? It was a great platform. And so these are some of the questions that I deal with in my research and in my writing. Um, but I'm here to talk to you about writing. Um, my writing is very much an Oxford story. And it begins, again, with that feeling of alienation and that feeling of wanting to do something, to put something in the world that helped people make sense of the space that they were living in. I, as I said, Kenyan, born and raised, I lived through the worst violence, uh, civilian inflicted violence in my country in 2007, 2008. There's something, until 2000, December 2007, I was going to do what a lot of um, smart, you know, working class kids who get an opportunity do. I was going to become an investment banker. And I had two and, had two and a half years of university under my belt. I went home to Kenya and my country was falling apart. And one thing you realize when there's a crisis and there's no food or water getting in and out of the city and people are dying and their homes are being destroyed is that no one ever looks around and says, someone get an investment banker. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to rethink my priorities and I had to rethink what my place in the world was going to be. 
And I came back and did a, a, a bunch of student journalism for my student newspaper at the University of Birmingham. Birmingham. Um, and I did a lot of student journalism and a lot of blogging. And then I came to Oxford and I had a vague sense that I wanted the writing to be more than just you know, student newspapers and student reporting. I wanted it to be something bigger. And my friend Abdul, who uh, was also a Rhodes Scholar from my year, um, wrote an opinion piece for The Guardian in which he was talking about uh, US health policy and US education policy. And anyone in this room who's met Abdul kind of, you, you know Abdul. Abdul was the youngest person ever to run for governor in Michigan. He has three doctorates, two doctorates and an, and a, and an MD, and he is 35. So um, Abdul writes this amazing article and it's super insightful and it travels and it becomes one of the most widely read articles in The Guardian. And every single response to it is, what are you as an American? What are you as a Muslim? What are you as a Rhodes Scholar trying to teach us in Britain about healthcare? And I was offended on his behalf because it spoke very sharply to how people think, you know, who people think has a right to say anything in the public sphere and who people think is a natural commentator and who people think is a natural observer. So I, I said to Abdul, you know, Abdul, I would love to say something about this. And Abdul said, sure, here's my editor's email address. And I wrote my email address. And anybody who has looked me up on the internet knows the result of that uh, particular op-ed. I wrote an op-ed called, Why, as an African woman, I chose to take a Rhodes Scholarship. If you're not comfortable with swearing, don't look that piece up. Uh, there is an expletive in there. And it became the, one of the top 10 most widely read op-eds in The Guardian for 2010. And suddenly I was awake to the power of writing. And I was awake to the power of narrative. And I was awake to the power of writing for a public, um, to a public, facing, uh, facing a public. And, but I didn't know what to do with that. And as I said, this was a very Oxford story. Because I was looking around this room and I was walking down these streets and there was nobody to tell me this is what you need to do next. In fact, if anything, I was getting the opposite message. That's a hobby. That's just something that you do on the side. You should do this, and you should do that. And the thing that made the biggest difference, my second year uh, here at Oxford, I was reading this social justice publication. I think if you work in African social justice, you would know this, Pambazuka. And Pambazuka is actually headquartered on the high street. And they had read my Guardian piece, and they said, you know, Nanjala, you should come down and meet with our editor-in-chief. Maybe you can contribute to us. I went to the meeting, and I said all of these things to Feroz. Feroz was the editor, and Feroz said, I see what you're trying to do, and I'm going to give you a couple of books to read. And I want you to read the book and come back to me next week, and then read another book and come back to me next week. And the first book that Feroz gave me was by a Nigerian Rhodes Scholar from 1986. He was, I think, one of the last Nigerian Rhodes Scholars before this current uh, incarnation. Tajuddin Abdul Rahim. And Tajuddin wrote a book called Speaking the Truth to Power. It's a collection of some of his most powerful articles that he's done for Pambazuka that are all about very sharply and clearly criticizing primarily African governments, but also in general, power. What is power doing in our societies? What is power doing in our lives? And it completely changed my life. Because here was a person who wasn't on these walls, who had had a similar trajectory than, as, as I had, as an African working class background, getting this opportunity to come to Oxford, and had gone back and had done this amazing thing. And unfortunately, his life was cut short. short. He was in a car accident in Nairobi, and he died um, through that. But he had made such a big impact in the social justice discourse in Nigeria and Africa more broadly. I thought, that's it. That's what I want to do. And the next week, I went back, and Firuz gave me another book. He said, Go and read this one. I think this one will take you to the next level. And that was Steve Biko's I Write What I Like. And I Write What I Like is also a collection of essays reflecting. But the thing about Steve Biko that I really loved was that he wasn't just writing. He was practicing. Steve Biko also died very young. He was 36 years old. He was killed by the apartheid government. He was tortured and killed. He was a medical doctor. He practiced medicine. And he wrote. And he created a theoretical framework that influenced the anti-apartheid movement. He gave a society the intellectual tools that they needed to process their oppression and to start thinking about a way out of it. And I thought, I shouldn't swear. I want to do that. <laughs> and 
I went back to Feroz and I, he will tell you to this day, I don't think I've ever been as excited about anything for the two years that I was at Oxford. <laughs> and he said to me, and I said, Feroz, this is what I want to do. And he said, you know, I'm going to give you a column. I'm going to give you Taju Dean's column. And I want you every week to write me an article that's broadly in the theme of social justice, 800 words, and we'll see how it goes. And so for the next year, I was writing, I was the speaking the truth to power columnist for Pambazuka for a year. And the last book that Feroz gave me is kind of the one that sealed the deal. And that was Edward Said's Representations of the Intellectual. This you can also find as a podcast. Um, it's a BBC Read Lectures from 1993. And I, I read it every year and I listen to it every year. Because what, what Said does is he takes Gramsci's conception of the organic intellectual, the fact that anybody, you don't have to have 15 university degrees and have read 20,000 books to be able to contribute and to articulate a view, a critical view to the world, to be able to give people, again, the tools that they need to process the circumstances that they're living in. And you don't have to be, because again, I had been living the subliminal messaging that you had to be Spinoza and Locke and Hobbes and all, oh, by the way, the, the, it was Spinoza. <laughs> Elizabeth knows what I'm talking about. Um, and you don't have to be this you know, person to be able to have something important to say. You could be an organic intellectual as the head of, as a, as a columnist, as a teacher, as a person working in media. You could do all of that. And what Saeed did for me was he gave me a why. And it's a why that I keep coming back to every year because um, sometimes it feels like what you're doing doesn't matter. And that, broadly speaking, is how I got started on this journey that I've been on for the last 10 years. I do a lot of public commentary for newspapers and magazines around the world. I do a lot of independent research and scholarship. I just had a book come out last year um, on what I just said, digital humanities. I write and I think a lot about freedom. What does freedom look like for ordinary people? What do just and inclusive societies look like? And sometimes that can look very abstract. Sometimes I'm writing about art, the Sudanese revolution, and how um, murals have become the key form of political expression in Sudan, and what that represents, uh, what that says about the 30 years of oppression that Sudanese people have lived under. Um, I wanted to stop, I'm going to stop there because I, I've been told I have five minutes, and I wanted to share with you the three quotes that, um, from those books that have stayed with me, and I hope that they will give you something to think about. From Edward Said, um, to me, writing is an expression of public intellectualism, as I've said. It's a way of giving, of, of existing in the public space as someone who offers a vision, as someone who is imagining possibility, as someone who is pushing the boundaries of what society thinks is possible and are feasible. And that to me is what writing as action is. It's not a, a role that one can take with trepidation. It's not a role that one can take with um, self sort of, I mean, you, you won't have all the answers. In fact, you would find that 90% of the time you don't have any of the answers. But what you're doing is you're offering up a vision of the world, and you're asking people, what do you think about this vision that I'm offering you? Is this something that you can buy into? Is this something that you can come along with? And the thing that Saeed says that I keep coming back to is this. The central fact for me is, I think, that the intellectual is an individual endowed with a faculty for representing, embodying, articulating a message, a view, an attitude, philosophy, or opinion to as well as for a public in public. And this is a role that has an edge to it and cannot be played without a sense of being someone whose place it is to raise embarrassing questions, to confront orthodoxy and dogma rather than to produce them, to be someone who cannot be easily co-opted by governments or corporations, whose raison d'etre is to represent all those people and issues who are routinely forgotten or swept under the rug. To me, that is what the point of writing is. That it's so easy to write to be famous. And especially now we're living in an ecosystem whereby people are, the machine is constantly looking for fodder and is looking for people to provide that fodder. And it's very easy to offer yourself up as that fodder. 
It's so very easy to perpetuate a message that has been funded by a corporation. It's so easy to be the person who decides I'm going to advance the argument that everybody else is already making. But the role of the public intellectual, the role of the writer as a public intellectual to me is to be uncomfortable, to make people uncomfortable, and to encourage your society to sit in the discomfort of what it is that they're doing. And sometimes that means being surrounded by people who have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And sometimes that means, you know, that your whole people that you thought were your friends, you know, I, I write about the Kenyan politics a lot. And I write about ethno-nationalisms and the ethno-national divisions. And I wrote articles that were critical of the government and I lost friends. I had people that I've known for 20 years say, I don't know what all of this is, but I don't want to be on board with it anymore because I dare to criticize their presidential candidate. What do you do in that point? Do you choose to, to be comfortable? Do you opt out? Or do you keep pursuing justice and freedom and as close as possible to truth as we can get? I think that question and that decision is what makes the difference between who is a public intellectual and writing as action as opposed to writing as a self-indulgent um, exercise in, I shouldn't swear, <laughs> stuff. Thank you. Well, that's a very hard act to follow. Uh, and I have to console myself with the rather pleasant realization that on this panel, I am the element of diversity. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so we're asked to talk about writing as action. And um, I think um, somebody yesterday said that it was a female characteristic to try and answer the question set. But I think probably um, there were quite a lot of men who have done that before even women were given the chance. And um, I have a bit of a tendency to try and do that myself. Maybe that's how I got however far I did get. But anyway, uh, I, I spent my life writing, but I don't think I could claim to have written any literature. And I, I wouldn't really claim even to have made any contributions to primary scholarship. Um, the nearest I got to that was what the French call haute vulgarisation. You know, I find the results of other people's scholarship and I've written them in what I hope are readable books that are, might be of interest to a slightly wider public. And um, so but my work was mainly journalism and then speech writing. I had the great privilege of being hired as a speech writer for the late Kofi Annan when he was Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, and uh, I suppose I contributed some bits to policy documents, but mainly it was sort of in the area of sub-editing and trying to make them a bit more coherent and a bit more readable and get rid of some of the acronyms and some of the clunky polysyllabic words. So I guess that you could call that writing as action. The production of texts, which are not an end in themselves, but intended in some way to contribute to public debate and public policy, directly or indirectly or at least to influence action. Um, I think in some of the literature preparing this conference, um, probably Lucas got hold of something that I used to say um, when people asked me why I had moved from being a columnist in the Financial Times to a speechwriter in the United Nations. And I used rather pretentiously to quote the Communist Manifesto <laughs> and say, philosophers have tried to understand the world, our problem is to change it. Um, but of course, um, journalism can and often has changed the world. Um, and uh, especially if, like mine, a lot of your journalism is analysis and commentary rather than straight reporting, you are at least implicitly trying to change the world. Um, and I think it's quite possible that some pieces I wrote um, in the Times or the Financial Times did more to change the world than the speeches I wrote for Kofi Annan. It's very hard to judge that. The, if there is a difference, I would say it's more in the way you see yourself than in the objective nature of what you're doing. Journalists like to think of themselves as impartial commentators, whereas when you become a speechwriter, you accept that you're part of a collective effort to shift events in a certain direction. So where do the humanities come in? Well, I studied history, 
and at least in my early life, I liked to think of myself as a historian. Um, and I, studying history as an undergraduate, I have to say that writing essays and reading books were much more important than listening to lectures, which were more or less an optional extra. Your tutor would set you a book list and uh, give you, say, you know, you have to produce an essay on a certain topic um, by the same time next week. And then he might say, uh, I understand Professor Trevor Roper or Professor Taylor is lecturing and you, know, it might, you might find it worth your while to go and listen to him. Um, <laughs> but that was really not the main um, part of the course. Um, so um, I have to push back a little bit against what Danny Dawling said yesterday. Um, he, w well, he wanted to make lectures accessible to the world. I don't I think I have any problem with that. Um, but he also wanted to abolish the weekly essays um, and put more emphasis on graphs. Well, that might be a better way of training geographers, and it might even equip you better for historical scholarship. But I gave up working um, on um, a scholarly effort, a, a DPhil, um, because my undergraduate education had not really prepared me for it. And I quickly, I quickly got bored and frustrated. And whereas I'd enjoyed my time as an undergraduate, I'd, I tried to think, so what is there in real life that would be a bit more like that? What were the skills I had acquired? I think the ability to grasp the essentials of a subject quickly and to express it clearly in a way that people would pay attention to or find easy to understand. Um, I got quite good at producing copy uh, in the shape of the essays um, uh, under pressure of a deadline. Um, you know, you often stay up the night very late or even through the night uh, getting the essay written because you've got to see your tutor in the morning. And um, I also learnt to sound as if I read most of the books on the book list instead of probably just the first and last chapter of one or two of them. Well, what profession requires you to do things like that? <laughs> Journalism, of course. <laughs> and what skills do we need as citizens in a democracy? I would say the ability to judge an argument and the evidence for it critically. Um, not achieving 100% certainty, and it was interesting to hear in the group discussion yesterday that even in what we used to think of as the exact scientist, sciences, um, people don't think of themselves as achieving 100% certainty. But you need to be, make, be able to make a reasonable assessment of probabilities and explain why you think one thing is more likely to be true than another. And the ability to express yourself clearly in a way that makes sense to other people when you, you want to inform, to educate, or to convince. And those, I believe, are skills that a humanistic education does or should help you acquire. And for the second of them, at least, I would say essay writing is not such a bad training. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was lovely to listen to the two earlier speakers. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here in Rhodes House after uh, almost three decades. Uh, I was a Rhodes Scholar in Oxford in 1986. So that's uh, 28 years ago. Uh, so it was wonderful for me to be here. And I want to congratulate Elizabeth actually on uh, what she's doing to Rhodes House and how the Rhodes Trust is actually opening up to students. You know, in my time, we never dared to come into this building. And the warden was a remote figure. And the only loving person was Mrs. Seti, who was, you know, who was this mother figure who was always there for us. But, um, but it was a very remote and a very aloof kind of a building. And we never dared to come in here. So I'm really glad that, you know, you've got the students in here and everybody's eating and, you know, and talking to each other. I mean, the food is fabulous. So, uh, it, you know, this is really an exercise in humanizing Rhodes House, which is, uh, uh, which is terrific. Um, 
So my journey in writing, I think, yes, you know, like you, it started off in Oxford. I think in Oxford, I was uh, constantly assailed by a kind of frenzy of self-awareness which I needed to constantly put into words because, you know, for the first time I was out of my country, I was an Indian woman in England, I felt like a traveling circus for an entire country, you know, I was a, I, I, had, the, I had to do the explaining and, and, and what India was all about and the history of India and the literature of India, I was, you know, I was India and uh, so I had to kind of put out a real show and, and this made me intensely self-aware and um, because of this self-awareness, I, I felt the urge to communicate this in uh, voluminous diaries that I wrote at the time. And that became a novel, actually, which uh, uh, a lot of people read and thought, you know, what, do you did all this in Oxford? And I was like, yes, you know, but it was, it was really a, a, a cathartic uh, kind of experience for me to be here and to write it all down. And, you know, it, it was also a journey for me in becoming intellectually self-reliant uh, and intellectually courageous. I think that was what I learned at Oxford, and that was a great gift that my tutors gave me, that you don't have to uh, learn the authorities and you don't necessarily have to quote your E.J. Uh, e you know, E.P. Thompson and your E.J. Hobsbawm and your A.J.P. Taylor. You can tell me what you think. And this was enormously liberating for me, that I could say what I thought and do my reading and advance my own conclusions and be unafraid that the tutor would not laugh at me. So I, I give tremendous thanks to my maudlin tutors, to Michael John and Lawrence Brockless and uh, Alistair McIntyre, who really did shape the way, um, the way I thought and the way I was able to construct an argument and also channelized this intense self-awareness in which I was with which I was wrestling all the time. Uh, I then became a journalist because, you know, as they say, you come to the, to the West to discover the East, and sometimes you go to the East to discover the West. So when I came to the West, I discovered a whole new perspective on India. You know, I, I, I realized how uh, the Indian national movement had worked. I had also studied it, and I developed a completely different perspective on my country in a way that I hadn't earlier. I hadn't thought dispassionately about uh, Indian subjects. I hadn't really had an idea about what Indian history uh, was teaching us or what the Indian national movement really meant or what the Indian uh, founding fathers were all about. So it gave me a completely different perspective. And it was a fascination in a way with my own country that has stayed with me uh, and that led me very uh, seamlessly to journalism. So journalism for me, the art of writing for me, was uh, the art of, uh, was the act of discovery and, and the act also of explaining what I too had, uh, had realized and had, uh, had experienced. Uh, I then became a political journalist, and it's been three decades of covering politics for me, both as a, uh, as a print journalist, as well as a broadcast journalist, as well as uh, someone who's active in the digital sphere as well. Uh, I think before I proceed any further, I, I want to tell you that journalism is facing a terrible crisis. Uh, and it's, it's facing a crisis not from uh, totalitarian states, but from democratic rulers. You know, what is happening to democracy is, I think, a question we should all ask ourselves. Democracy is being subverted by de democracy. Democrats are subverting democracy. You have elected leaders who have come through the democratic process, who are turning their backs on democratic functioning, on the democratic institutions, on the principles of democracy, and on the institutions of democracy, on the free press, on free speech, on free thought, um, and uh, free assembly. At the moment in India, the world's largest democracy uh, is facing its most fundamental challenge. Uh, it is challenged very seriously by the forces of religious nationalist majoritarianism. Uh, and this is a very uh, sinister force because it commands tremendous consent. Uh, it is a highly popular, highly uh, widespread, universal phenomenon, uh, focused, telescoped on the personality of the supreme leader. Now, if you gaze around the world, you will see the rise of the, uh, the elected autocrats, 
uh, you know, Elizabeth and I were talking about Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, Recep Erdogan in Turkey. You have, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump, yes. Uh, and, and Mr. Narendra Modi in India is a similar elected authoritarian leader who is massively popular precisely because he is authoritarian. And this is the cult of the supreme leader that uh, is there across the world today. And this makes democratic functioning or uh, democratic freedoms extremely vulnerable. And for those of us in the press and those of us in the media who are uh, engaged in speaking truth to power or who are trying to speak truth to power, are finding ourselves in a situation where uh, you're up against state agencies that are not just, uh, they, you know, they're not just upset with what you say, they actually want you to stop saying it. So you will be sacked, you will be, the media house will be shut down, you will be forced out of your job, you will not be allowed to write. These are the kind of, uh, methods that are increasingly being used to simply shut journalists up. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, it's, it's as if journalism is being criminalized. You know, it's as if asking a question is now a criminal act. Uh, the, the, the laws of sedition that the British colonial rulers uh, uh, wrote for India are being in increasingly used on citizens who are voicing uh, their views or writing their, their views. So I believe writing in this situation is about, an, is about an act of courage, is about speaking truth to power, and is about making people self-aware. I think if we're not self-aware, then society does tend to ossify, and society does tend to become congealed in its orthodox ways of thinking. I think self-awareness is what moves us forward. Self-awareness is what makes us question uh, our surrounding realities. And I think the journalist, when she writes, must be an agent by which ideas are transmitted and by which self-awareness is, uh, is encouraged. Because you can consent to something, but do you know what you've consented to? You've given a vote to something, but do you know what you voted for? So I believe that the act of um, consent that we all give as voters uh, should, constantly be to, should constantly be questioned. We should question what we have consented to. So uh, to speak truth to power, to get people to question their assumptions, to tell the truth above all. You know, telling the truth is becoming difficult nowadays because this is the area, this is the, 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 the era of post-truth. As somebody said to me, the journalist has to be the person who gives you the truth. You can't say X is saying it's raining, Y is say it's raining, Y is saying it's not raining. Let me now take a balancing view. You know, the church of both sidism. Um, I must take a balancing view. Is it raining or is it not raining? What's the opinion? I have to look out of the window and tell you whether it's raining or not. That's the truth. So it's the truth that we have to tell you, not this kind of both, the church of both sidism, as it's called, that we're increasingly trapped in. Uh, the balancing act between two extremely polarized uh, uh, segments of society that journalists increasingly have to straddle. In this uh, highly polarized uh, society, truth is a casualty because uh, everything is judged according to your so-called political biases and your so-called leanings. But I believe it is in this particularly challenging time, in this polarized time, that the journalist has to write uh, uh, consistently uh, for the truth. Because without truth and without uh, a notion of the truth, uh, then there is, there is really nothing. Uh, I think it's also important in today's times to write in a way to puncture the politics of spectacle. I think the media is creating what is called the politics of spectacle. Uh, it is the leaders who survive by spectacle, the leaders who survive by the great extravaganza, uh, who survive by visual extravaganzas. So I believe it is uh, imperative for journalists to write to puncture that extravaganza, not because uh, you want to puncture it for partisan reasons, but because you want to tell the truth about what is being um, hidden underneath that uh, underneath that spectacle and underneath that extravaganza. I think it's also very important for journalists to write to uh, bring out uh, the real truth about areas which are increasingly falling off the map. Uh, there are large sections of, of you know, there, there, there are communities in India, places in India where uh, the media simply is not going. Uh, you all know what's happening in Kashmir. And uh, it's, it's, uh, 
It's terrible that journalists and uh, activists and human rights lawyers are not allowed to go to Kashmir. But I think that struggle has to go on. We have to try and find ways to report the truth from Kashmir. We have to uh, find ways to report the truth from the Northeast, where, as you know, uh, the government of India is carrying out the uh, National Register of Citizens, uh, where almost uh, three million people could be rendered stateless because of this register of citizens that the uh, government of India is undertaking. Uh, these are also, as, these are Im imperative, it's imperative that journalists go to these places and uh, bring out reports from uh, areas that have so-called fallen off the so-called media mainstream. Not only do we need courage to do this, we also need the power of words. Because the power of words can actually achieve a lot. And governments are scared of words. They're terrified of words. Because words, when put in a certain context, can mean a lot. And the humanities, I think, are particularly imperative uh, to give us this power. Because the humanities are, as Elizabeth and I were talking, they are the citizenship disciplines. You know, they are the endlessly nuanced, the sort of soft subjects uh, that that teach you that there is no absolute truth, that there are shades of truth, uh, that there are ways of looking at things, uh, that there are flaws, there is a struggle to overcome flaws. The tentativeness, the nuancing, the softness of the humanities, I believe is essentially democratic. Uh, I read this wonderful book by Dan Madigan, which said the hard sciences are actually incredibly conducive to religious fundamentalism, <laughs> because they, uh, they have this uh, notion of the, of the perfect answer to the perfect question and the technologically ordered universe and the technologically ordered society according to certain technologies. Uh, well, be that as it may, that's a controversial point. But uh, I do believe that the humanities uh, need to be emphasized, particularly because democracy is in such a crisis across the world, particularly because politicians are usurping so much power, particularly because we need checks on how political power is, uh, is, is expressing itself, particularly because we need to strengthen our institutions. I believe huma the humanities is fundamental uh, to this exercise. Uh, a very seminal moment for me in Oxford was meeting Sir Isaiah Berlin, who was then fellow at All Souls College. And Sir Isaiah told me something that I, uh, that I hold to this day as a kind of talisman. We, he had a wide-ranging interview with students, and he spoke at length about liberty and democracy. And he was, of course, the great liberal sage at the time. And he said that, I was just sharing this with Elizabeth, that you know, the quest for perfection or the quest for perfectibility is responsible for mass inhumanity. You know, throw out the Muslims, throw out the Jews, clean up the immigrants, clean up the religious minorities. Let's have this perfect society. Let's have the, the perfection of a well-ordered universe or the perfection of the, uh, of the clean society, the pure society. Uh, this was the, the, the thinking that actually uh, led to terrible horrors of, of uh, human beings on fellow human beings. So it is, in fact, that compromising human element. We are humans. We compromise. We trade off. We, we're flawed. We're trying to transcend our flaws. Uh, that is what uh, makes us human and uh, keeps us uh, united in the quest for liberty and greater freedom and democracy. Uh, that was also a conversation. We also had a conversation about the two great Indian texts, uh, which are the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. These are the two texts that are revered as divine by Indians. And in each of these texts, uh, if you read them, you'll find that actually there are no, there are no recognizable gods and goddesses with magical powers. There are, in fact, human beings who are trying to be their best selves, who are trying to overcome their flaws through their actions. And that is where the divinity lies. That is the divinity within human beings, is that we are flawed, but trying to transcend those flaws and trying to overcome those flaws through uh, action. So I believe that is how writing can work, to accept that there is a flawed condition out there, and we can make it better through writing, through negotiation, through dialogue, uh, not, for the quest of, not, for, not for the quest of some perfect ideal, but because we want to struggle through our flaws to achieve the best possible result, the best possible result. 
the best possible society, uh, uh, the best possible way of ruling ourselves. As, as, as Churchill said about democracy, it is the least bad of all forms of government. And I believe that all of us at this stage, all of us who are writing, all of us who are writing in the public sphere, do need to worry about democracy, and we do need to think about democracy, and we do need to, in a way, be soldiers for democracy if we care about democracy, and we, if we care about liberal democracy, because it is under threat all over the world. Uh, so I'll leave you with that, and I think that uh, as journalists, uh, certainly speaking truth to power and trying to make democracy liberal, trying to keep our freedom safe, has been uh, my endeavor through writing. And I believe that anyone in the public sphere who is writing today uh, would do well to keep these challenges, these severe challenges in mind. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for kind of talking and taking us through the role of writing, so to say, in broadening an understanding of the self, of where we come from, like how you said, kind of how it made you kind of re-see your own context from a new lens, um, and also articulating oppression, um, and also understanding and better understanding the current context and being able to reimagine um, democracy from not being co-opted, uh, from not being kind of turned into what it is increasingly becoming, especially as we see kind of more and more attacks on higher education, more privatization, and humanity is of course the first thing that gets, get, gets attacked in totalitarian regimes. So in that context, writing as action becomes a really relevant panel and um, something um, to think about. You also opened up other interesting points around writing as representation and how that can be very empowering, but also can kind of limit, um, whereas where you, know, you were kind of seen as kind of standing in for India. Um, and so what it does when writing um, becomes representation. Um, and so kind of with all of those thoughts, since we have less time, we thought we'll open it up to the audience and take some um, questions and facilitate, facilitate a conversation amongst the three of you and with the audience. You and then. Um, my question is for uh, Nanjala. Um, hi, <laughs> thank you for a very inspiring uh, speech. Um, you spoke about, um, you know, the organic intellectual and um, the public intellectual at the end of your uh, speech there, and um, as Sagarika was describing, I, I mean, these are some of the types of people who are most under attack uh, in democracies that, for example, in India or in Turkey, which are the two places that I'm most familiar with. Um, I mean, these people are the targets, um, uh, you know, whether they function as uh, writers or as academics or as lawyers or as activists, um, anybody with uh, some kind of an intellectual vocation who is also public facing is likely to be uh, in very serious kinds of trouble. I mean, I don't just mean uh, the kind of bickering that you know we are used to, but um, really it can be a life-threatening situation, and, and and many people find themselves in jail or as um, as was described, you know, out of a job or or driven out of the country into exile and so on. Um, do you encounter this kind of um, uh, danger? Um, increasing danger in your own society, in your own context, um, or are you still um, fairly well able to practice, um, you know, a kind of uh, public pedagogy through your writing or through your intellectual work, through your activism, um, without feeling so hampered that it's really a choice between speaking out and, 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 and endangering your, your very survival. I mean, has it come to that in places that you're familiar with and you're active in? That's a great question. Um, one of the 
subject that I write about is police brutality. And I wrote an article um, about police brutality in Kenya and sort of the genealogy of police brutality in Kenya starting from the pre-independence era all the way to the modern age. And the argument was basically that um, this is not a uh, glitch, this is not an error, this is how we police in Kenya. The police, Kenya police is a colonial institution. We got it in 1922. This whole idea of criminalizing youth and criminalizing young black men is embedded in the way we police in Kenya. And this is one thing that I, I would, as a safety precaution, whatever, having a good editor on your side is one of the most important things a journalist can do. Having an editor who will insulate you from some of the more um, extreme forms of risk or whatever is really important. And I've had both. I've had an editor who totally threw me to the wolves. I wrote an opinion piece. They put an inflammatory title on it, and I got completely creamed. I mean, I got weird emails and everything like that. And they said, well, you know, you're a freelancer. But this particular case, the editor was called by the head of the Kenya police and took the meeting and didn't tell me about it until afterwards and said, you know what, don't worry about it. I, I've got this. And so those kinds of relationships can make a huge difference. Um, do I feel a, a certain risk? Um, yes. I will qualify that by saying that Kenya in the region has a longer history of freedom of expression than most of the other countries in the region. That does not mean that we do have complete freedom of expression. We do have a great deal of censorship. I feel protected or insulated by the fact that I mostly write for publications outside Kenya, and then kind of the story kind of comes back to Kenya. Um, that's also a, a, a strategic decision, because Kenyan editors, like I said, will give them not just your name, but your home address and your phone number, and her mom works here, and her dad works there, and da 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 And so, <laughs> because that's the, status, that's, the, that's the level of state capture that Kenyan media houses are dealing with. So the risks are a little bit different. Um, I think this is why I, I, Saeed is so important, I think, to me and to the work that I do. This is not a role that is easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. If it was easy, everybody would stand up and say, I am Spartacus. Um, and the reason why you have this weird ecosystem that we're living in whereby um, the trivialization and the sense, sort of sensationalism, sensationalism that is surrounding very serious topics, a lot of it, I think, comes from um, people opting out from the difficult questions and opting out from the nuanced questions and the nuanced conversations and saying, here's the sexy one. I'm not going to, to unpack what you know, free healthcare for all, all Americans means. I'm going to tell you that Elizabeth Warren, is she electable? You know, that's pursuing sensationalism over the difficult and boring but important, necessary um, analytical work that has to happen in order for writing to become an actionable point. Um, we have journalists in jail. We have political prisoners in East Africa. Stella Nyanzi's in jail. Um, Edward, uh, Edwin, um, what's his the Tanzanian fellow is in jail. Peter Biar is in jail in South Sudan for criticizing the South Sudanese government. Um, we have journalists who have gone missing. We have journalists who have disappeared and goes back to the point about this is not uh, an Indian thing, and it's not a Turkish thing, and it's not a, uh, an American thing. The, the, I, the, the point is, journalism is under attack, and good journalism is under attack. There's a lot of money for sensationalism. There's a lot of money for um, spin, the triumph of PR. There's much less money for people who are doing the boring work of telling us how we got here and what we can do to fix it. I hope I've answered your question. Thank Welcome you so much. Here. Thank you all for an incredible um, discussion, so needed. I just wanted to chime in with what this speaker said and, and um, follow what you said, what you said, because what, uh, so I, I, I'm privileged or cursed to sit at a place where um, I see attacks on journalists and on civil society globally when a lot of, um, a lot of these situations unfold in a way that we can't see comparables very clearly, and so we, we feel very, very atomized. Um, but what I, I just want to share is that I'm seeing that there's a systematic 
oligarchization, of course, I think we all see that in democratic societies, but there's also, and, and I've written about this, the same political advisors and think tanks are advising these oligarchs in um, formerly strong democracies, and they're advising them to do similar things to journalists and to independent influencers. So I, I'm not surprised to hear comparable kinds of attacks on journalists in countries where we're used to seeing those kinds of attacks. But what I want to share is journalists and independent um, influencers and thought centers like universities in the um, in places which have more expectations of freedoms of speech are being assailed in new ways systematically. And that what um, we're seeing is that the Cambridge Analyticaization of political opponents is being directed using often digital tools, but also what you mentioned, which is going after livelihoods, going after employers, doing a campaign of you know trolls aimed at the editors, aimed at the publishers, putting pressure on livelihoods, we're seeing that also in um, you know, North America and Western Europe. And I just wanted to share that I think we need a, like a clearinghouse to share best practices for how to resist this and inform people about it because it is not clear to me how to protect people against it. You know, Elizabeth and I were saying, I really think the time has come for us to have the demo democracy dialogues, you know, and to really take stock about what's happening to democratic functioning across the world. Absolutely. And how political power is increasingly encroaching into every area of life and compromising the institutions of democracy. Because democracy is not just elections. Exactly. You know, you can't just have elections after elections and less and less democracy. That makes no sense. But it, to take stock of what's happening to democratic values and institutions, and what's happening to, you know, as you rightly said, it's not just, it, it is journalists, but it's also thought. You're criminalizing free thought. You're criminalizing dissent. You're criminalizing the act of asking questions. You're criminalizing scholarship. Ananya knows to the extent to which uh, intellectuals and historians are persecuted now in India. So you know, uh, if you're going to criminalize free thought, uh, and as you rightly say, if corporations and the think tanks are going to all be complicit in this criminalization of so-called minority voices or dissenting voices, that we really have a problem on our hands as to how, as to whether democracy is really working for individual liberty. Um, can I just, I also just wanted to jump in on this point because I think one of the things that needs to happen is we need to get better at paying attention to what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, so I wrote, I've written a book about the role of technology and politics in Kenya and um, I had been researching the role of some of these multinational corporations and of course the name Cambridge Analytica came up and I wrote about it and, and people were like, well, you know, this is not really a global problem. This was in 2016, July of 2016. Well, this is not really, it doesn't really sound like a big deal. This doesn't really sound like an important thing. And when the Channel 4 did their big expose, suddenly it was like, oh, I see. And what people don't realize is Cambridge Analytica has been active in India since 2011. Yeah has been active in Kenya since 2013, has been involved in two Kenyan general elections, has been in Nigeria since 2015, has been in South Africa longer than that. And we had been screaming from the rooftops that you know American PR corporations and British PR corporations and French PR corporations are skewing our democracies. We, we know what it means to stand in line for three hours to cast a ballot that is then decided in Washington DC, that is then planned in a boardroom in London. And we're saying, hey, stop. You know, hold your institutions accountable. And we're being told, well, you guys are just not ready for democracy. <laughs> Maybe Africa's just not ready for democracy. And so now that this sort of chickens have sort of come home to roost, Suddenly, it's like, well, who could have seen it coming? <laughs> well, we saw it coming, and we told you, and you didn't listen. And this is the, but this is the context in which we're living. Like I said yesterday, indigenous communities have been sounding the alarm about climate change for years. You know, people in Bangladesh have been warning about rising sea levels for years. The, the encroachment of the Sahara Desert, the, the impact of oil. Ken Sarawiba lost his life because of you know, um, non-renewable shell and their actions in, in the, the Niger Delta. But because of the way in which the media market is centered around um, certain markets, you know, the, the, the New York Times can tell Kenyans that you know, we're going to write about you. We are not going to write with you. 
we're not, you are the subject, you are not a, a, a part of this narrative framework that we're building, then you become stuck because you're, you're, you're writing and you're publishing and you're fighting all of these energies in your own domestic context and you're still not able to get the message out in time. This is definitely something that I would, I would love for everybody in this room to take away with you. No one can stop you from reading news or consuming information about another part of the world. In fact, it should be part of your daily diet to learn about things that are not necessarily in your core wheelhouse. Specialization is killing intellectual curiosity and, and it's okay to be a polymath. It's okay to be interested more than the thing that you went to school for. We're going to just end with one last question. I know Dhruva, you had your hand up. Um. Thank you so much. Um, so I was just trying to reconcile a couple of things you said. Uh, you started off by pointing out that journalists need to speak the truth. It's raining outside. Uh, but then also argued that the humanities are good because they show different shades of truth and don't make any claims to a particular kind of truth. Um, and also was interested that you pointed out that even natural scientists don't make claims to truth. They just say things with varying levels of confidence. So as a journalist or as a writer, do you or the others have any reflections on how you consider truth and objectivity, especially with regard to political questions on which there are people on both sides? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, the journalist has to uh, be the agent disseminating objective facts. Uh, as a discipline, the humanities are tentative and nuanced and don't come down on truths, on philosophical truths, uh, on political truths, but on the actual facts of a story or the facts of a report, I think there one can't be too philosoph philosophical. You know, there you have to just tell what is happening. There's a riot in a state where a certain number from a certain community are dying and a certain number from another community are dying. You have to tell that objective reality. Um, I think uh, that's why it's important that uh, too much of opinion, opinionating that happens in the media at the moment. You know, uh, uh, it's, it's breaking news as well as breaking views. But I think that from the deluge of information, you have to be able to give knowledge to the reader and give knowledge to the, uh, to the viewer. You know, you have to convert information into knowledge. And you can only do that if you actually provide the reader and the, and the, and the viewer with, with objective realities, which are the truths. Uh, you, you know, and, and of course, there is the whole domain of post-truth, and there's the whole domain of uh, fake news, and there's the whole domain of, uh, of, of fiction, which is, be, which is going out increasingly as fact, because it's being relayed all the time. You see, you take a, you take a bit of uh, information and just relay it on all the social media platforms and all the digital platforms, it becomes the truth. And then everybody uh, accepts it's the truth. I'll give you a recent example. There was a, uh, a report uh, recently in one of the Indian newspapers which said that actually the Gandhi had not been assassinated. He died uh, out of an accident. It was an accident and he just died. It was not even an assassination. Now, will many people circulate this news that Gandhi actually accidentally died and he was not assassinated? Will we 20 years later believe that Gandhi was killed by accident and it was not an assassination? Uh, that, that, that's, you know, increasingly what the truth teller is up against. Also history writing. You know, history writing is now embattled with political um, opinions on either side. And, uh, you know, as you know in India, I mean, history is highly political and history is, the, the, the history textbook is the battleground of uh, different ideologies. Now the fact is, uh, you, you know, what I argue in, in, in my book is that uh, India has become what is known as the big state. It's not, it's, it's the colonial big state. It intrudes into every sphere of life. The state is increasingly telling you what to read, what to think, what to eat, what to wear, what to worship, uh, you know, who, who you can marry, who you can love. The state is, is now intruding into every sphere of life. And I believe that this colonial suffocating state has to be rolled back for the sake of individual liberty and it has to be rolled back for the sake of truth. Because if the state takes over all of history writing, then you're going to have politically partisan history textbooks across the board. Uh, if, you, if the state takes over all of entertainment, if the state takes over the uh, uh, dissemination of information, you're simply going to have politically biased information, entertainment, history writing across the board. Because you know it's the organs of state 
that are now being used for politically partisan uh, aims, as is happening in the United States. You have a political party and a, a president of a political party who's seeking to settle political scores by using state power and by misusing state power. So the state has become completely captured, as you said, by politicians. And this is why I believe that you know, we can't, uh, the journalist has to stick to the facts and to the truth as far as possible all the time. You have to keep your eye on the truth. And you have to produce good, solid, verified journalism. You know, journalism that goes through the filters, that goes to the copy editor, that then goes to the uh, national uh, bureau editor, that then goes to the editor, and then he finally signs off on, uh, signs off on it. So solid, fact-based, verified journalism is, I believe, the only thing that can counter this flood, this fire hose of false information that is coming at you uh, all the time. So while I you know, applaud the humanities for not being politically um, absolutist in, in truths, but at the same time, that is distinct from the journalistic work, work a day, work in trade, where the journalists must disseminate the hard facts. I don't think you, you entered the group discussion on um, truth and the post-truth society last night. Uh, I think you could have made a good contribution. Um, I, I think that we all have a problem, the journalists and the academics, um, because uh, you know we have been forced over the last really during my lifetime, uh, to think about what entitles us to say things in a dogmatic mm. way. Um, and I certainly did that as a journalist, um, and I realized that you know, my perception of what had happened was not necessarily shared by other people who were present or who were participating in the event that I was describing. And I think at around the, the same time, I guess 70s, 80s, um, a number of, of, of academic disciplines began to interrogate themselves mm -hmm. in a similar way. Anthropology, I would say, especially with the rise of relativism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, this in one way is a very good thing because mm -hmm. it means that you, you don't assume that your own culture, your own society has all the answers and that you're in a position to judge and um, disallow mm -hmm. what other cultures have mm -hmm. to say. Um, but I, I agree, actually, with what has just been said, that um, there is a danger there, and I think we are seeing that now. Uh, and what was very interesting to me, as I said, was that in this group we had um, uh, somebody from what I would have described as an exact science, uh, who said, you know, this is a false binary. Um, mm -hmm. The science is not exact in the sense of saying this is 100% certain mm -hmm. and that is zero. Yeah. It's always, if you, you have to arrive at a judgment of what is something 90% or 99% probable or only 40 or 50%. Yeah. And the danger, of course, yeah. is that once you say that, mm -hmm. then it's taken up yeah. by people who want to undermine the very concept of truth. And that's what we're yes. seeing now. Um, so I think that we did need, and we still do need, to have a more sophisticated understanding of reality and how we apprehend it and uh, how, we can, how we can discuss it. But that doesn't mean you can say what you like. And it doesn't mean that it is impossible, as you say, to look out of the window and see whether it's, it's raining, raining or, or not. not. Uh, you I can't, mean, you, but you, you know, you've, got, you've got to be careful about how you do it. And in the end, I think this was the point that Alan Rusperger was making yesterday. And uh, it's the point also made, um, I'm very grateful um, to um, uh, my partner in the discussion who drew my attention to an excellent article last month in the New York Times about Bruno Latour. Um, who is a great um, figure in the relatively new discipline of um, science and technology studies. Mm -hmm. He actually looked at how are facts produced in laboratories. And he's going, yes, they are produced. They're not, it's not that they're sort of sitting there uh, waiting for a brilliant scientist to mm -hmm. discover them. And this came out very clearly in the so-called climate gate uh, mm -hmm. discussion, you remember, about mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. in, uh, which was really around the University of East Anglia, but it had repercussions all over the world. <coughs> um, you, you do <coughs> have to understand that even what appears to be an exact science 
there always has to be room for discussion, disagreement, questioning, checking and rechecking. It, it doesn't mean that in the end you say, oh, well, anything goes and um, uh, you can believe what you like. But it is a subtle yeah. point and it's one that we mustn't let go of and yes. we have to keep making. Yes. And, and you know, you, you're, you're absolutely right. You can't use the philosophical wrangling over, uh, over you know, different ways of seeing something and use that to demolish the very idea of truth or the very, very idea of a exactly. fact. You can't use the fact that you, know, you were saying, is this a Western perspective or this is a country perspective or you know, to, to the philosophical nuancing that brings you uh, to a conclusion. You can have debates about that. But if you use that process to undermine the notion of a fact itself, uh, then I think you're really going into very, very tricky and, and you're, 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 you're the, it's, it's mass derangement there. But the only way to avoid it is there have to be institutions and networks yeah which achieve credibility. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, um, because the fact is, we can look out of the window and see whether it's raining. Very few of us, if any, in this room could say of our own knowledge why we know that the climate has warmed in the last 100 years. We know that, or we think we know it, because of people who are more specialized than we are, mm -hmm. who have really studied in detail what's happening, and have assembled a massive volume of evidence that supports that conclusion. Mm. If we don't have some institutions, and that has to include media institutions, mm. I, I would say even perhaps particularly, but also scientific ones, um, that we can actually feel some confidence in. So that it's a sort of two-way process. Mm. And, and, and I think that, that, again, I think this is what Alan Rusbridger was really saying yesterday, that we have to find networks and institutions in whom we have sufficient confidence that we are not completely lost in the world and, and, and confronted with a sort of meaningless fog. There is a reality that we can at least approximate to and make our decisions about our lives in relation to. And for that, we're not gonna do it on our own. We need to have mm. networks and people doing specialized jobs who we can actually feel confidence in. And, and I think the politicians are doing this, you know? I come back to it, it's the politicians. And I think the enormous powers of the politician as citizens and as liberal citizens, I think we need to work to push back. Uh, I was enormously inspired by the UK Supreme Court um, when, when Lady Hale came out and with that glittering spider brooch and she said, <laughs> the king hath no prerogative but that by which the law allows him. You know, so it's the, it's, it's the rule of law and the law. You cannot have politicians breaching the law and breaching institutions simply for political power and taking over all these spaces, taking over the truth space, taking over the fact space, taking over judicial spaces, institutional spaces, simply in the quest for political power. Uh, so, I agree, but we yeah. can't help ourselves if we, <laughs> if we uh, as it were, sort of criminalize If we criminalize the politicians, politician, yeah. No, no, we can't I mean, do that. We, but, have to, but we, we, as a citizens, yeah. have to be prepared to discriminate, listen yeah. carefully yeah. to them yeah. and think, that one knows what she's talking yeah, about, yeah. and that one is talking nonsense. Yeah. We can't abdicate that responsibility. Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the usurpation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, we will, I think we'll continue because there's a lot of things that you've opened up. Even though we started with writing as action, I feel like we've broadened the idea of writing and action yes. to talk a lot about writing as learning and listening, posing nuance to kind of the world of spectacle, role of history and times run by propaganda and place of truth in a time where we have a flood of information. So thank you so much for opening up many questions. <laughs>